Today we're going to discuss the statute of frauds, which concerns the kinds of agreements that must be in writing in order to be enforceable. If an agreement falls within the statute, then having a written contract is a requirement for enforcing the promises in the agreement. We'll discuss the historical origins and context of the statute, the types of transaction that fall within the statute, and the requirements for fulfilling the statutes uh, itself, and the consequences of non-compliance and varying judicial interpretations of the statute. Let's start with some historical background. In 1677, the English Parliament passed the precursor to the modern American statute of frauds. It was called an Act for Prevention of Frauds and Perjuries. The Act was meant to prevent individuals from falsely claiming that another party had promised them something, and from then suing that party for breach of the alleged contract. This kind of false claim was particularly pernicious because in England at the time of the statute's enactment, interested parties to litigation, that is the parties who had a real stake in the outcome of the lawsuit, the plaintiff and defendant, were not permitted to testify in court. If A claimed that B agreed to sell him a plot of land and then breached their contract, then neither A nor B could testify about the alleged agreement. To combat this phenomena, the Act for Prevention of Frauds and Perjuries required that certain kinds of contracts had to be in writing and signed. Section 4 of the Act required that no action shall be brought unless the agreement upon which such action shall be brought shall be in writing and signed by the parties to be charged therewith or some other person thereunto by him. Uh, lawfully authorized. For certain types of actions, these included suing one for agreeing and failing to pay another's debts, suing for violation of agreements made on consideration of marriage, suing on agreements for the sale of land, and suing on agreements that could not be performed within a year. Section 4 has been widely imitated since then, and as the restatement second of contracts, section 110 makes clear. And you can see here basically the same provisions appearing uh, almost word for word. Section 17 of this 1677 statute of frauds governed the sale of goods. It provided no contract for the sale of any goods for the price of 10 pounds sterling or upwards shall be allowed to be good except the buyer shall accept part of the goods sold or give something in earnest to bind the bargain or that some note or memorandum in writing of said bargain be made and signed by the parties to be charged by such contract. That section two sees a very similar counterpart in the UCC in section 2-201. Subsection 1 provides that a contract for the sale of goods for a price of $500 or more is not enforceable unless there is some writing sufficient to indicate that a contract for sale has been made between the parties and signed by the party against whom enforcement is sought. A writing is not insufficient because it omits or inc incorrectly states a term agreed upon, but the contract's not enforceable under this provision beyond the quantity of goods shown in the, in the writing. The provision only requires signing by the party against whom enforcement is sought because the seeker is not denying the existence of the contract, it's only the other side. But subsection 3 of this provision lists some ex uh, exceptions. A contract which does not satisfy the requirements of, of subsection 1 but which is valid in other respects is enforceable, A, if the goods are to be specially manufactured for the buyer and are not suitable for sale to others in the ordinary course of business, B, 
if the party against whom enforcement is sought admits in his pleading, testimony or otherwise in court that a contract for sale was made, or C, with respect to goods for which payment has been made and accepted, or which have been received and accepted. Admitting that a contract was made and a buyer's payment or acceptance of goods is a fairly good substitute for a buyer's signature. But specially manufactured goods might substitute for a seller's signature as an indication that the seller must have thought there was a contract or wouldn't have uh, produced these specially uh, manufactured goods. So here's a question. The statute of frauds was meant to address false allegations that an agreement existed. But in addressing that pro problem, could the statute promote another kind of fraud? Well, sadly, the answer is yes. It might encourage the converse concern, alleging no agreement existed when in fact an agreement did. Without the statute of frauds, we're apt to see false allegations of contract uh, when the parties never in fact agreed. But with the statute, we're apt to see false denials of contracts where the parties actually did agree. Parties can protect themselves from denial fraud by insisting that the other side to a contract always sign an agreement. Then she can't deny the contract's existence. While false allegations of oral contracting are much harder to disprove, so we might on balance prefer the statute and rely on parties' incentives to insist on written contracts to avoid denial fraud. Sadly, parties still make many oral arguments, make many oral contracts that are not reduced to writing, and so the statute of frauds actually promotes uh, uh, some fraudulent deniers to escape liability for breaching their actual promises. This is one of the reasons why the statute has been repealed in, of all places, the jurisdiction of its birth, England. Complying with the statute. The statute of frauds requires not only that contracts be in writing, but also that they be signed. Think for a moment of the kinds of contracts you've entered when you shop online, for instance. Did you sign those agreements? The official comment to the UCC 2201 says that the word signed includes any authentication which identifies the party to be charged. Generally, courts take a broad view of what constitutes as a signature. The restatement second of contracts, 134, says that the signature may be any symbol uh, or adopted with an intention actual or apparent to authenticate the writing as that of the signers. So, A and B agree to a contract, the terms of which A makes a written record. A writes OK, followed by A's initial at the top of this record. Does this qualify as a signature by A? Well, the answer is yes. As the UCC and restatement suggest, courts have taken a broad view of what counts as a signature. As hinted a few minutes ago, the fact that many transactions now place electronically sits awkwardly with requirements that certain contracts be written. Accordingly, in 2000, Congress passed the Electronics Records and Signature in Commerce Act, also known as the E-Sign Act. This act provides that a signature contract or other record relating to a transaction uh, may not be denied legal effect, validity, or enforceability solely because it's in electronic form, and that a contract relating to such transaction may not be denied legal effect or enforceability because an electronic signature or an electronic record was used in its formation. Further, almost every state has adopted the Uniform Electronic Transaction Act, uh, the only two non-enacting states are New York and Washington, which overlaps significantly with eSign, but is even more comprehensive in allowing you to uh, <coughs> uh, sign uh, for an uh, internet contract uh, by just clicking through. Uh, so what happens if parties fail to comply with the statute of frauds? 
a failure to have a writing and a, a sufficient signature doesn't render an oral agreement automatically uh, void. Rather, an oral agreement that falls within the statute of frauds uh, but is, does not meet its requirement will be unenforceable at the option of the party against whom enforcement of the uh, agreement is sought. In legal terms, it's voidable, not void. So, if A and B orally agree that B will sell A several acres of land, and the parties never put that agreement in writing, and afterward B fails to sell the land to A, A sues B, and the contract will be unenforceable if B raises as a defense that the statute of fraud requires such an agreement to be in writing. Jurisdictions differ on whether a person raising the statute of frauds defense needs to promise or represent under oath that there was, in fact, no agreement. Does the seller in the land hypothetical just given above have to say there was no agreement in a deposition, for example, or is there her attorney signing uh, of a brief uh, that, raises, that raises this defense? Is the attorney signing sufficient to make a claim of there not being a contract. Uh, previously, we discussed promissory estoppel and the famous section of the restatement, section 90, uh, which is the promissory estoppel section. What happens if someone makes an oral promise that falls within the statute of frauds and the other party relies upon it? Well, section 139 of the restatement addresses this and repeats the language, the elements of section 90, saying that the agreement is enforceable notwithstanding the statute of frauds if injustice can be avoided only by enforcement of the promise. What about the UCC? There's disagreement over whether promissory estoppel can be used to save an oral sales contract that falls within the statute, but which is not in writing, uh, under the UCC. The inconsistency extends not just between, but within jurisdictions. See, for example, the Seventh Circuit's opinion in Manetti versus Anchor Hawking Corporation. There, the court outlined some of the arguments for and against applying promissory estoppel to save an agreement that failed to meet the statute of frauds requirements under the UCC. That opinion explained that it had, in past cases, quote, cut loose promissory estoppel from contract law and permitted promissory estoppel in statute of frauds cases, but that it was having second thoughts lately. So, what have we learned? We've learned that certain kinds of contracts must be in writing in order to be enforceable, and that this re requirement has deep historic origins. We're familiar with the basic types of contracts that fall within the ambit of the statute of frauds. Contracts to buy and sell goods over $500. Contracts to buy or sell real property. Contracts that cannot be performed within one year. And contracts offering something in return for a marriage promise. And finally, agreements to pay another person's debt. But we've also learned that parties often can pursue promissory estoppel theories just as if the agreement in question weren't one to which the statute of frauds applied. Let's start with some historical background. In 1677, the English Parliament passed the precursor to the modern American statute of frauds. It was called an Act for Prevention of Frauds and Perjuries. The act was meant to prevent individuals from falsely claiming that another party had promised them something and from then suing that party for breach of the alleged contract. This kind of false claim was particularly pernicious because in England at the time of the statute's enactment, interested parties to litigation, that is the parties who had a real stake in the out, discussed the historical origins and context of the statute, the types of transactions that fall within the statute, and the requirements for fulfilling the statutes uh, itself, and the consequences of non-compliance and varying judicial interpretations of the statute. 
Today we're going to discuss the statute of frauds, which concerns the kinds of agreements that must be in writing in order to be enforceable. If an agreement falls within the statute, then having a written contract is a requirement for enforcing the promises in the agreement. We'll come of the lawsuit, the plaintiff and defendant, were not permitted to testify in court. If A claimed that B agreed to sell him a plot of land and then breached their contract, then neither A nor B could testify about the alleged agreement. To combat this phenomena, the